Some of the children in this hospital ward traveled for weeks to get here after being shot, knifed, or hit by shrapnel in the ongoing war in Ethiopia's Tigray region. 15-year-old Bariha Gebre has lost one eye and is permanently blind in the other. She and her cousin went out to play in the yard. Suddenly they saw people running. They also ran and they were both shot. It took Gebre weeks to get to this hospital in the regional capital, Makala, as they traveled from town to town, trying to find a clinic to treat her. He says everywhere he went, he found health centers destroyed and looted. After the fighting stopped, the nurse for this clinic in Edega Hamas returned to find a burnt-out tank, bullet-riddled signs, and dead soldiers on the streets. Like so many others, her clinic was empty. Yes, I came and uh, the door is uh, opened. The glass are broken, and the equipment are stolen. Nothing here. Patients, including children and victims of rape, still come to her with war injuries. But there is very little she can do. Emergency medicines were there. It was stolen, and some is here. Infusionists and dressing, suturing. All the equipments are stolen here. Tefatowicz says she refers patients to the few hospitals in the main cities where medical workers say they are short of supplies in every department. In the Eider Hospital in Mekala, some children say losing their limbs has been less painful than losing their loved ones. My older brother was with me. He was injured and died. The Ethiopian government says it takes very seriously its responsibility to alleviate the suffering of the people in the Tigray region. The government blames the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front for the war that began last November after a coordinated attack on its forces in the region. But many people in Tigray say the region is under attack from federal forces, Eritrean forces, and Amhara militias. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Makala and Edegahamas, Ethiopia. Safety, also hard to find in the war-ravaged Tigray region of northern Ethiopia. Not to mention facts and food. First, let me tell you that the Ethiopian Air Force is now admitting it carried out what they call successful airstrikes on Tigray's capital. That is according to state-run media. It is a big U-turn after the government originally denied Monday's air raids on Mekele had it even happened. The UN says three children died in the attack. Well, the last time airstrikes were launched there was last November, when the conflict between the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front and the Ethiopian government... And we only now know from the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian um, Affairs that three children were among those killed in this operation. So, officially, Becky, in this cycle where 
the Ethiopian government carries out an operation and then they deny it until the evidence is overwhelming and then they half-heartedly own it. And yesterday we heard from the U.S. State Department expressing concern and also from the U.N. Secretary General spokesperson. Listen. Once again, remind all parties to the conflict of their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. This includes hundreds of humanitarian workers on the ground of working tirelessly to provide assistance to millions of civilians caught up in the fighting. Move to the Horn of Africa to conflict in northern Ethiopia. Five months in and the conflict in the Tigray region of the country not resolved. United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF sounding the alarm about life for children in that region. Over 1.4 million children have been out of school for a year. There are also reports of increasing sexual violence. Let's discuss this now with senior spokesperson for UNICEF in Nairobi, Kenya, James Elder. James, good evening. Thank you very much for your time. I believe you've just returned from a trip to that conflict zone in northern Ethiopia. Could you tell us what you saw and heard? Hi, yes, yeah, I was there last week. Look, unfortunately, what I saw, Sally, is a, an increasing crisis unfolding for children. You mentioned 1.4 million kids out of school. All your view viewers will know millions and millions of children are out of school around the world. The difference here is that they're not in the classroom. They're in a conflict setting. Uh, this conflict started in November when just as people would have been harvesting that crop for a year, giving them the food and the income for the next 12 months. They missed that. They're about to miss the chance to plant. And really good uh, water systems and education, sorry, health systems have been destroyed, either destroyed in the fighting or then looted. So we're seeing education, protection, as you mentioned, terrible, harrowing stories I was told of rape of children and women. We're seeing a crisis on all fronts unfolding day in, day out for children of Tigray. calls coming Tuesday morning, and they were horrific. 
an active shooter at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, just west of San Antonio. The gunman made entry into the school and complete disregard for human life, just an evil person, started shooting kids, anybody that was in his way, teachers, had no regard for human life. Authorities say 21 people killed, including 19 young students, little boys and girls, along with two of their teachers, more than a dozen others transported to nearby hospitals. Police say the gunman, 18-year-old Salvador Ramos, unleashed his attack wearing some type of body armor and carrying a long gun. The first responding officers, including Border Patrol agents, were unable to stop him. Officials say they put themselves between the kids and the shooter to draw his fire away from them. Two of the officers struck and injured by the gunman's bullets. When SWAT teams arrived at the school, a second firefight ensued. The suspect ultimately killed. At this point, the investigation is leading uh, to tell us that the, the suspect uh, did act alone uh, during this heinous crime. Authorities say shortly before the attack, Ramos shot his grandmother at her home. She's now in critical condition. He then traveled to Robb Elementary, wrecking his truck in a nearby ditch. Minutes later, authorities say Ramos entered the school, unleashing his rampage on helpless victims. <laughs> Law enforcement came in, I, they locked down the school really quickly and uh, and they started evacuating children out through breaking windows and pulling children out. Bobby Studer's wife, Terry, is a math teacher, just days away from retiring and was inside when the deadly shots rang out. I had just taken her some flowers and uh, the minute I got my pickup, I heard a couple of shots. Terry escaped uninjured. But her colleague, Eva Morales, a fourth grade teacher and educator for 17 years, was killed. The school's campus now a massive crime scene as investigators try to piece together what's now the deadliest school shooting in Texas history. My heart was broken today. We're a small community. And well, we need your prayers to get us through this. Texas Governor Greg Abbott calling the tragedy a senseless crime. In just two days, he was scheduled to join Senator Ted Cruz and former President Donald Trump at the National Rifle Association's annual conference in Houston. Overnight, President Biden expressing his frustration with the NRA. When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done. This morning, families and a community dealing with the unthinkable. Their children and loved ones are gone. And this may be the most painful image. Instead of school buses driving away, a fleet of horses. Another school day in America ending in tragedy. As we mentioned, a lot of people are still injured. This community has asked for blood donations. They've also asked for prayers, but so many across the country say they are sick and tired of just prayers. They need real change. Sandy Hook, Parkland, and now Uvalde. Just to name a few, when will it all stop? You don't have to be a parent to really feel the magnitude of this moment right here, you know? But as a parent, I can tell you these second, third, and fourth graders, they were in that sweet spot of youth, right? That age where all they do is radiate joy. And, and, and today, this morning, I'm, I'm thinking about those parents who have been robbed of so much. Hoda, there is no takeaway from this. This is just awful. I agree. 100% agree with you. Tommy Amos, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.
it's hard to know where to start. Tom Winter, mm -hmm. I've never, covering mass shootings since Columbine, as you have, heard anything like this. What Stephen McGrew, who heads the Texas Department of Public Safety, just described, uh, Chris, as somebody who covers this uh, for a living, is, I would say, um, the greatest failure in modern American law enforcement history as it pertains to an active shooter, period. What he described was an incident commander or a situation where, and he says he doesn't know whether or not this incident commander, uh, the person who is the chief of police for the school district, this is his primary job, is the safety of this school. Um, what he says is the, he made the conscious decision not to enter the classroom while students, as you described, children, as you described, were calling 911. On one particular occasion around either 1243 or 1247, that caller was begging for the police, saying, please send police now. Earlier than that, at 1216, a 911 caller told the operator that eight to nine students were still alive. At that point, a member of the law enforcement community was clearly aware that there were children that were alive inside that classroom, and the decision was still not made. We do not know, and he said he did not know or could not share the information as to whether that information was ultimately relayed to the incident commander, who was that chief of police for the independent schools district there. But what we do know is that we had somebody who was armed a tremendous amount of ammo. By the way, we have to discuss Extraordinary. that. Extraordinary. 1,657 rounds that he had purchased. He said 350, 300, th 315, excuse me, rounds were fired into classrooms at some point. It is a, almost a miracle that we are not talking about two to three times the amount of students that are dead here. Um, he talked about the tremendous amount of spent magazines that were found there, uh, but he continued to fire shots. And I just want to double check my notes. 1221, he had still fired shots. Um, this was a and shooting apparently that began on the 911 call at 12:21, you could hear shots fired. That's exactly correct. So we're talking about somebody who was shooting, began firing at the school, according to the timeline he put out at 11:31 a.m. local time. Still firing at 12:21 local time. It is not until 12:50 local time that police shot, fired shots inside that classroom at the suspect. And at 12:51, officers were beginning to remove kids from the scene. I think a very important point of this, Chris, McGraw could not say, and they have not yet determined whether or not any lives could have been saved if they had moved in sooner. Uh, I think the quote, uh, I, I wrote it down at the time, I think is, is the most important one here, uh, which is he says um, that it was, quote, he says, quote, it was the wrong decision as he reviews uh, what happened that day. I don't think it says it any clearer than that. Uh, happy to get into more of the timeline, but also happy to hear Frank's thoughts as well. Yeah, well, uh, one other quote that stood out for me that um, was the decision made by the scene commander, and this is the quote from Stephen McGraw, the belief is there may not be anyone living anymore, again, in spite of the fact that the 911 calls were coming in. Meantime, this. Meghan Markle paid a surprise visit to the memorial in Uvalde yesterday. She was seen leaving a white roses tied with a purple ribbon. A bodyguard was by her side at the time. The 40-year-old Duchess of Sussex also walked around that memorial to pay her respects by the white crosses bearing the names of the victims. <laughs>
in Davos. Um, Brian, what's the mood on the ground there? Hey, Akiko. Well, the mood on the ground, at least for me, is uh, interesting because it's about 70 degrees out of here. I'm rocking my nice orange badge here, which gets me into all sorts of places, as Brian Chung knows very well, because he was in Davos as well, too. <laughs> the black badge is the real one you want. But look, uh, I think there are a couple uh, early takeaways from day one at Davos. First thing, uh, a multi-speed recovery. Every conversation that I've talked to or I've had with leaders here so far on day one at Davos, they're, a lot, they're saying business is growing. Now... Time for the conversation, and I see a man who is hard to miss, who's already going to rise to his feet and offer us the first reaction. Well, George, it's uh, good to see you here again, uh, though I have to say you are uh, uh, even less cheerful than I've seen you in, in some other years. Before I ask my question, I, I would like to just share my sense with the audience of why it's worth listening to you on this topic. You've been right about Russia or Putin and right about Ukraine longer than just about anybody else. Uh, the Open Society Foundation has, has played a key role in the development in Ukraine of a civil society, of the formation of a Ukrainian state, of a sense of national consciousness. Uh, I don't believe that, that one can think of many acts of philanthropy, sustained acts of philanthropy anywhere in the history of the world that have had this kind of impact. At the same time, you saw very early the danger of Vladimir Putin's Russia. I remember back in 2008 when Putin first violated international norms as opposed to domestic ones by attacking Georgia. And someone there said, well, shouldn't we be trying to get back to normal and calm down the crisis? Your response was, that sounds a little Chamberlain-esque. Uh, and I think you have seen the pattern over the years of a failure to respond to, the, to Putin's uh, accelerating aggressions and the state to which they brought us. And your sense of the stakes, I think, in, in this war, absolutely right. Um, the question that I would like to ask is, given all this, no, no one knows the situation in Ukraine, I think, as deeply as you, except for the Ukrainians. But what's your perspective as a friendly and sympathetic outsider on the strengths and the weaknesses that Ukraine may bring to this historic confrontation? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you, you, Ukraine, you, you, Ukraine already showed in 2015 that it can fight for freedom. So it's, uh, it's all the more shows that Putin is uh, sort of caught up in his own uh, idea fix and doesn't actually pay attention to, uh, what, to reality. Uh, and I, uh, uh, so I think uh, Ukraine today is rendering a tremendous service to Europe and to the Western world, to open society, and uh, uh, our survival. Ukraine is the focus of the world's attention right now, but there are other crises in the world that we must not forget about. Among them is the conflict unfolding in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region, where the ruling party has been fighting against the central government since late 2020. Just last week, the World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros, said that there is nowhere else on earth where the health of millions of people is more threatened than in Tigray. And Dr. Tedros called on the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments to end an unrelenting blockade, which has seen aid and commercial supplies prevented from getting into Tigray 
for months on end. And this blockade has left some 6 million Tigrayans facing extreme food shortages. Tigrayans are suffering in other parts of Ethiopia too. Thousands have been swept up in mass arrests, while last week a disturbing video emerged of a Tigrayan man being burnt alive by armed men, among them government security forces, in northwestern Ethiopia. The persecution and humanitarian suffering is unlikely to end until the war in Ethiopia does. But as mediation efforts stall, it's unclear when that might be. And I have to say, um, when I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I would know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy right. forum. And that's true in Argentina too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I'm here with the president, with a young global leader, but what is important for me We face a formidable convergence of disease, drought, famine, and war fueled by climate change, inequity, and geopolitical rivalry. As you know, this health assembly marks the end of my first term as director general. I'm humbled by the executive board's decision to nominate me for a second term. As I have reflected on the past five years, I realized they have been bookended by two visits to war zones. I made my first trip as Director General to Yemen in July 2017, a country which was and remains mirrored in civil war. Then, two weeks ago, I was in Ukraine visiting bombed hospitals and meeting health workers. I visited a reception center for refugees in Poland where I met another mother from the Mariupol area who told me that when the shelling began, her young daughter was very scared. Don't worry. Her mother told her, it's just a thunderstorm. It will pass. At our warehouse in Lviv, I held a pediatric crutch that WHO was preparing to deliver, a crutch for children, but a tool that children should only need if they're injured playing sport or climbing trees, just children being children and hurt, but using the crutch, not if they're hurt by bombs. 
a second five-year term for Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO. Director General of the World Health Organization. No other candidates challenged him for the post. The WHO chief expressed thanks for the reappointment and hopes for peace. When I visited Ukraine, when I saw, especially the kids, I felt what I felt. You may not believe it. When I see the kids, it was the image from more than 50 years ago that came to my mind, so visible, so haunting. The smell of war, the sound of war, the image of war. I can't even understand. So visible, so clear. And it happened many years ago. That's what I don't want to happen to anyone. Tidiros, a former so government minister from Ethiopia, has directed the WHO throughout its management of the global response to COVID-19.
Do you hear what this man is saying that he wants to find out about the safety of the potion by testing it on your children, on our children? Psalm 127, 3. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And in Matthew 18, 6, it reads, But whoever calls one of those little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's not hard to see how our Heavenly Father feels about the children. Crews in Texas are trying to get a handle on those big wildfires burning out of control there this morning. The fires have destroyed something like 50 houses so far. Hundreds more homes are in danger. Crews did get some help from the weather on Saturday, at least a little bit when the winds died down some, but they are expected to pick back up later today. Our entire viewing area is under the threat of severe weather late Monday into early Tuesday morning with an enhanced risk, a level three on the one to five scale for the city center and areas north of the I-10 corridor. The biggest threats will be some damaging wind with 70 mile wind gusts and an excess of that. Some hail and torrential downpours could lead to some street and even some flash flooding. We could also see tornadoes embedded within some of these stronger thunderstorm cells. Oh, Take it, Lord, take it, Lord, take it away from us, Jesus. 
Holy Ashid, and the Son, and the Ashan. Father God, all the powers in your son's name, take this up away from our home. As you did for Elijah, you take this away from us. It's the million-dollar question Houstonians are wanting to know. Comments flooding on social media. What is that? I saw it too, but wasn't sure what it was. Mysterious, yes, but someone knows. It could have been a lot of stuff, but what was it? What was that bright red light in the sky? The light seen in parts of East Houston, including Friendswood, League City, and other surrounding areas around 8.30 Wednesday night. It has been a wild week of weather across the state. First, the massive wildfires and now a dangerous tornado outbreak. Fox 26's Matthew Seedorf spoke exclusively with a Houston area firefighter tonight who is on the front lines of the Eastland Complex fire. Firefighters in Texas trying relentlessly to contain several massive wildfires. Roughly 200 fires so far, burning more than 170 square miles since Thursday. It's sandy, dusty, and it's, just, it's relentless up here. Jason Adams, a fireman from Spring, speaking with us from the Eastland Complex fire west of Dallas. The blaze growing to roughly 55,000 acres. A lot of what's burned out here is coastal hay pastures, and it burned so hot so fast, it, it literally took everything. Like, the roots aren't even there. It's, it's like a dust bowl up here. The fire burning at least 150 buildings so far. Families left digging through what's left of their homes. My dad's dog tags, we found those yesterday. So his military dog tags, because he was in the army. A wild week of weather across the state. Monday, a deadly tornado outbreak. tornado. At least 20 twisters leaving behind a devastating path of destruction. I never experienced anything like this before. It was loud. There was a lot of noise and it was just scary. This illustrates the birth of Hurricane Isabel, which occurred over the Ethiopian highlands. Uh, and the maturity of these, these cloud systems as they track towards the west, picking up energy, moving across the Sahel of Africa, gathering a lot of energy over the warm tropical waters of the Atlantic. This storm became a Category 5 and stayed a Category 5 for three days in a row, which is unprecedented for a hurricane in the Atlantic, finally making landfall as a Category 2. Now, when Isabel hit the United States, as a Category 2, it was an enormous Category 2. It was about 1,000 miles in diameter. It's absolutely huge. And uh, this was an enormous windstorm for the mid-Atlantic. Three and a half million people were without power for as long as a week or so across the large area of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and this particular satellite sequence, you're able to track the entire life cycle of this storm. The white shows the cloud tops and the colors indicate the rain intensity of this system. Now, a little bit more about the birthplace of these hurricanes. We have to focus in on Ethiopia itself. These are called the Ethiopian Highlands. And what we're looking at here is terrain mapping information, which was acquired by the space shuttle. So it's very, very high resolution terrain information. You know, the Ethiopian Highlands are a mountain range about 15,000, 16,000 feet tall, and they lie right along the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a rift zone. It's a crack in the earth where Africa is literally splitting apart very slowly. The moist trade winds flow over these mountains, and as they change, the name might fly, it does come across the Karen Desert.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>